Hey everyone, uh, I think we'll get started. People follow in here. Um, thanks for coming out to AT New Tech tonight. I'm Brian Kelly. Um, I've been hosting and helping host this event since uh, late 2015. I'm also co-founder and CEO at a local uh, tech startup called Census. Uh, we were spun out of University of Michigan last year in cybersecurity software. Um, and uh, it's, it's a privilege to host this event every month and find five great founders who get to pitch their ideas. Um, my, my, my short story is before I moved to Ann Arbor in uh, 2012, one of the things that showed me that there was more of a growing scene here than one or two companies uh, was the fact that there was a meetup group with a couple thousand people. And today we have over 6,500 or so registered members, um, even through the summer, like last summer, anyone who came out, like we had a pretty full light session, June, July, August. Um, nice weather today is good and bad. Good because we can go hang out at uh, Dominic's afterward outside. Uh, bad because people are probably like, I don't want to come inside for a couple hours to hear stuff. Uh, but uh, and we have some really great pitches lined up tonight. Um, who is here for the first time, your first new tech? Can you raise your hand? Uh, without without fail, it's usually like fifty percent. So welcome, you're you're in good company. Um, we've been meeting here the third Tuesday of every month for years, um, more than more than five, less than ten. Um, and uh, what, what's neat about this community is um, whether you are uh, curious about startup companies, you're thinking of starting your own business, you maybe are. Uh, have some money, you think of investing in startups, um, are you coming from the legal side, student side, developer, uh, everybody's welcome here. Uh, we, I think of this as a, a good opportunity to demystify what entrepreneurship and startup companies are all about, uh, which is really just finding uh, an underserved need and you having the, the, the itch to, to solve it more than competitors, big or small, that are out in the market. Um, and uh, our format is uh, each, each company, each founder will present for five minutes and we'll do five minutes of Q&A. Uh, when you have your question, just stand up, raise your hand, I'll call you and um, uh, it's, it's going to be really tempting to uh, give comments and your like, feedback to the presenter, but try to put it in the form of a question that always goes best, it's easiest for the presenter to uh, react uh, and it makes it more fun for the audience. Um, other notes, I usually usually see me up here with paper, but I completely forgot to print out my notes today. So, um, oh, uh, who's hiring right now? You throw up a hand. Okay, only one. Who's looking for a job or is curious? All right. This is normally where I go, look at all those people hiring, look at all those people. So, uh, there'll also be time to uh, uh, make an announcement after the pitches tonight. So if you are hiring, if you are looking for work, if you are exploring a new idea and you're just wondering if somebody else might know something about the, the market or idea that you have, I will make time for you to make your announcements after the pitches this evening. Uh, thank you to there's a number of people who helped make this monthly event possible. The venue that we're in, um, there's an entrepreneurship clinic at the U of M Law School. Uh, fun fact, if you are a company based in Michigan and you want some uh, pro, pro bono help, for-profit company, but you want pro bono help, you can get it from the entrepreneurship law clinic. So IP, um, et cetera, really any, anything the, the entrepreneurship clinic of the law school will help you out with that. They also donate the space every month, so shout out to them. Uh, A2 Geeks, uh, A2 Geeks is a nonprofit dedicated to making Southeast Michigan and Ann Arbor a great place for geeks and creatives to live, work, and play. Roger Rail, Roger Rail's down here on the camera. He donates his time every month and puts our videos up on YouTube. It's awesome and I really appreciate it, Roger. If you wanna hire him for this kind of work or any other kind of videography, check out R2 Vive, his company. Um, in addition to myself, there's a number of other organizers. Was anyone out last month out at New Tech? Got to see Brooke. She hosted for the first time, which is awesome. Uh, Brooke Boyle, uh, David Corcoran, my actually a good friend and co-founder of a current company. He has hosted a number of times. And then Doug Song, Zach Steindler, Scott Goshi, David Bloom. There's a whole bunch of us who help make sh people come in, find this event every month, and curate the speakers. Um, and finally, one more thank you to Ann Arbor Spark. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ann Arbor Spark is committed to bringing together organizations and individuals to support the growth of company and the creation of jobs. 
uh, they are kind enough to make a donation towards our food every uh, post party. They have been doing for, you know, since the beginning of this year. So I really appreciate their support. Um, definitely check out Ann Arbor Tech Trek. I think it's June 15th. I don't know why I remember this, but I do. Uh, you get to go, like it's an open house for all the startups in town. You'll definitely hear about it if you're on any of these mailing lists. Um, okay, so that's, I think, all the formal, oh, yeah, no, one, a couple other notes. Um, so we have uh, some openings to pitch in June and July, but not August. Uh, August is reserved for Desai Accelerator companies. If anyone remembers, last year we do about two of these a year. Anyone that's gone through the um, Desai Incubator uh, Accelerator all will feature their companies in August. Um, but in June and July, we have some room to pitch. So if you or if you personally or you know somebody that might want to pitch, email organizers at a2newtech.org um, and I'll, I'll probably reply to you and ask you a few questions. Really the, the criteria I'd like to have is that you've done some customer validation. You don't have to have sold the product yet, but you have to have spoken with some people who you think are your prospective customers. Um, and, and hopefully you've built a prototype that's cheaper than it's ever been to, to build a, a reasonable prototype. Um, but uh, that's mainly what I'm, I'm looking for. If you're still at the idea stage, that's great. Come out here, talk to people. And I'm gonna encourage you to get in front of people you think might be your customers. And if you've done that even with like a dozen or so folks, um, you could be ready to pitch. So uh, our agenda in this room will run till about eight o'clock. Um, I think I uh, mentioned five companies pitching and then we'll do community announcements. Um, last but not least, I'm bringing it back, my favorite podcasts right now. I know everyone's been on the edge of their seats waiting to hear what I'm gonna suggest. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of like entrepreneurship ones. I, I don't know, maybe I'm just expanding my, my interest, but I'm going to uh, uh, call out this podcast Dissect, if you haven't heard it. Um, uh, so this is just a cool story. Like, so this guy, individual, uh, was just like a music major, went in professional, didn't like pursue music as his path. And then uh, several years ago, he created this, pro this podcast called Dissect, where he takes um, long form analysis. So it does like a one hour episode for like 15 episodes across an album. And um, the, uh, the first album that, that he had done uh, was uh, Kendrick Lamar's uh, To Pimp a Butterfly. And last season he did Kanye West's My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. Those, both those seasons are amazing. And he just kicked off a new season um, today and it's sponsored by um, Spotify. So this guy was like just doing this himself. Spotify said like, we wanna, we wanna help support original content. And um, uh, I just think that it's just a really cool story. He got to quit his day job basically. And he gets to produce these, uh, he's amazing at it, produce this podcast. Um, other shout outs, uh, so Vox Media's Ezra Klein show, I've been into. Um, there's two episodes I'll call out in particular that are really interesting from April 30th and April 16th, Mega Identity Politics, uh, as well as Is Modern Society Making Us Depressed? I know, I'm really lifting up the room here, but <laughs> check it out, it's super, it's, it's, just, um, it's like a single interview, uh, one uh, guest on sort of conversation. Um, I just think it's terrific. And, I just, I just keep, The Daily is also in my regular rotation, so the New York Times podcast, The Daily. All right, now to the main event. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ross Geerlings to the stage. Ross, come on up. Ross has a startup called Seeker. Uh, Seeker is cost-effective, scalable, sensitive data discovery for network shares, workstations, databases, and websites, and he's gonna tell us about it. Take it away, Ross. So like Brian said, I'm gonna talk about Seeker and sensitive data discovery. Um, so sensitive data discovery is an important part of DLP or data loss prevention. Um, it's basically where you find what is on your network um, that you're, you're afraid could get out there. Things like social security numbers, credit card numbers. Um, it's very important to a lot of organizations, particularly when you uh, have regulated sensitive data. Uh, you know, PCI, DSS, payment card industry, uh, healthcare, you have HIPAA, there are um, federal requirements where you have FISMA, you might have export controls, ITAR, or financial controls, GLBA and SOX. Um, a study in 2016 found that your average cost of a breach where sensitive data is exposed is $4 million. 
And uh, that comes to something like, uh, I think it was like $158 per record in a regular business if you're healthcare, then it's like maybe 258. Um, so it can be very expensive. Uh, so there's commercial software out there, um, and basically two products dominate the market right now. The top vendor claims to have 10,000 customers. Um, but with these products, like a lot of other things in the IT industry, there's been this move toward per device licensing, which can get very expensive uh, when you have a large organization. Um, some free solutions came along in the last 10 or so years to try to uh, kind of provide a, a cheaper way to do, or a free way to do this. But uh, they both wound up being basically abandonware. Um, uh, myself, so I work, uh, I work at uh, a large university, have worked there for a long time, and uh, we had forked one of these two tools called Spider, and just wound up being so, so much work uh, that I thought it would be better to just kind of start over with a, a different uh, and better product. So uh, that's why I've done Seeker with a per scanner license. Um, also, it, it will get, um, so relative to the free solutions, um, you know, you can run against a scan of 10,000 workstations. You're not gonna be able to do that with anything free. Um, you can run against a file share, we've got 70 terabytes of data. Um, that's been successfully done with it multiple times. Um, the detection rates and false positive rates are about on par, um, dead even with market leaders. Um, it also gives you a little more control. So. Um, when you have things like medical record numbers, uh, a lot of times you just have this like eight digit number. If you search for that across your network, um, you're just gonna get ton, you're, you're gonna be flooded with false positives. So in Seeker, there's something called a, a companion regex where you can say, okay, well, if somewhere relatively near that in the file or maybe in a file name or a related location like a column name or a table name in a database, if, if we also have this acronym that this hospital always puts with its medical record numbers, then and only then flag it. Um, Seeker covers a lot of target types. You can get your Windows servers and clients, file shares, um, you can get websites, spider websites, um, SQL Server, uh, MySQL, and Oracle database servers. Um, so let's take a look at a, a video of, of Seeker working. This uh, example is on a file share. So this is a university. You have uh, five departments here. So you select that folder, you say, I want to treat every department as its own. Um, so every subfolder is its own target. And you go ahead, start the scan, name it. Very simple, runs very quickly. This is a pretty small sample. Um, and then we, when we close that out, we get our report. So in this case, there were 14 detections, 391 instances of social security numbers and credit cards. Uh, very similarly, you can do this with endpoint uh, servers and workstations. So there we just select an OU and Active Directory. Um, we get everything in there. Hit scan now. And it goes out on the network and finds everything that's currently on the network. We have a couple workstations that we have an error there. They weren't on the network. That's why there's a continue scan button. Sometime later, you can hit continue. It'll cover those. That's remotely executed. Um, so it's running locally on all those machines. You can also run it through their admin shares. It, it, um, and that brings me to the reporting. So the reporting, you get a summary uh, of the different detection types and what your top detection locations were, um, as well as the detailed data. You can export that to HTML, Excel, CSV, or PDF. Um, that could be very handy to use this data uh, with other things. Um, and with that, I'll go to questions. All right. That's right. Uh, throw up your hand if you have a question. Right down here. Uh, who would be your primary customer, and what ex what precisely would they use it for? So one example uh, would be, you know, I mentioned the the costs when you have, uh, you know, uh, the competitors tend to charge about. 
say $1,000 per server per year that they're covering or, or $10 per endpoint per year that they're covering. So if you have 100 servers and 10,000 endpoints that you want to cover, that's 100 grand a year for each. Um, then you know there, there are also other nickel and dime charges like it's per database on a database server and it's like the thousand dollars for for that right so um well, so basically what do they do when they about, find it sorry <laughs> yeah, hold on it, basically places like universities that can't budget that um but yeah what do you do when you find it well um you would probably categorize it as um most of these should if, in cases i've seen most of these should just be deleted usually you're going to search locations where you don't think these things should be um, if there's a business requirement, um, you know, you can make that exception, um, or you, you can let other ones be. But this is just a way for IT and central security departments to understand where all the things are that maybe they should be worried about that shouldn't be out there. Can I ask a follow up for that? Um, sure. So, is a, I mean, really, you're trying to compete purely on the price slash business model here um, versus functionality. Um, I think that's okay, okay but yeah, I'm just trying I mean, to understand it. I would say, I, I would say that's most of, of what I'm trying to solve is, is that I think there are solutions that are priced out of yep. almost any, like, you, like I said, almost any university yep. budget and a lot of companies' budgets. But there are other things as well, like I mentioned the, um, uh, the companion regex. Mm -hmm. um, I think with a lot of things, it's it's virtually impossible to look for things like medical record numbers, and this lets you do that. How how um how has your go to market been so far? Like, have you identified kind of a list of universities you think like, that are early targets? For I you? have. And in fact, I just sent out a list uh, in the last up within the last couple of weeks. I sent out a list. The first forty uh, of uh, I think about hundred and. 20 or so universities, so the first third of that, I actually sent a, a cold email to some contacts of these, and I was actually very pleasantly surprised. I got five um, interested people talking to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, pretty good response rate so far. Yeah. And I have two large universities already using it. And can you give a sense of like how far deployed or like how big of these co how contracts they are? like? They could, they could, um, it's it's in use, but like give a sense to the scale or how much more you want it to, to be at those existing places. Yeah. So the the one is uh, one of the two is using it for the health system. Mm -hmm. I'd like to expand to the rest of the university. Um, the other one is is using it pretty extensively. Actually, uh, the flip side of that is true with the other one. I'd probably like to get it into the health system at the other one. Okay. Uh, question in the middle. Here. Uh, so how would you connect to a host to other servers if you're before? Sorry, what? How does it connect to other hosts to scan files? How does it connect to other hosts? Um, so over SMB, you can get to the admin share. Um, uh, then as far as the, you know, the other, what I said was remote execute. You, it's actually putting the executable there. Then there's a TLS connection formed back to send the results. Okay, just, so you are installing agents on every machine where we need to scan? Are you are installing an security pool? At, at, this point, at this point, that's not a permanent install. It's sent out there, run, and wipes itself out when it's done. Uh, there is going to be a permanent agent in, in the future. Question over here. Is this uh, commercial only, correct? Or do you see this for individual consumers as well? Emphasis is really commercial because it's, uh, again, it's kind of solved the problem of scale and affordability. Um, you know, it, the consumer solutions are fairly cheap. One more question if anyone has it. Got it. I was wondering how you authenticate to these different places and are you worried about that access providing like a security vulnerability? Um, so, in terms of, I guess whether your software is secure because you're like getting access into all the database, all the database, like, and like collecting it all in one place or something. Yeah, um, I, I know what you're saying. Uh, I'm not worried about in terms of security of my software. I mean, so it, it checks very, it, it 
it ensures the connection back, it's over, it's over that TLS connection, um, and it verifies that user, and, and the, the session that was initiated to that machine is, is verified. Um, I, I don't see too big of a problem there. Okay, great. Thanks, Russ. Yeah. All right, next up, uh, we have Erica and Ben from uh, Saganworks. Saganworks makes it easier to organize, find, and share your digital knowledge. Uh, they are building software that works the way our brains work, using 3D technologies to leverage the power of visual and spatial memory. Sagan works the name, fun fact, is uh, inspired by Carl Sagan's writing on truth, science, and wonder. What's that? Hey. hey guys, um, I'm Eric Black, I'm the founder and CEO of Sagan Works, and I'm gonna just really start, actually I should wait until better you said. Logging in right now. Okay, give me one second. Sick. Okay. So uh, I'm imagining that most everybody in this room has the same, a similar problem. We all have access to knowledge and information across our across the cloud, whether it's in Dropbox, Google Drive, Office Online. You've got bookmarks in various services or embedded in your browser. You've got files on your desktop, on your hard drive. You've got photo services. You've got music services. You've got videos someplace else. The list goes on. If we're really good, we're organizing them by putting them in file folders or using effective tags to locate them. And even if you do that and you're looking for that article or that document or that photo, that image that you created three weeks ago or even three days ago, what does it take you? Half hour, hour, long time to find and maybe only you know, a small percentage of the time do you find what you actually have. So we have this really difficult conundrum. We, we have access to amazing data and information uh, on any device across multiple tools and platforms, all kinds of data types, but the organization tools that we have to keep track of everything are kind of stuck in the analog age. File folders are file folders, they're pieces of paper. Uh, tags might as well be library labels in the Dewey Decimal System or a little marker on a, on a bookshelf. So one of the problems is, and I think one of the reasons that people haven't come up with a better way to help us organize and aggregate all this information is that our brains work better, our memory is stronger when we see things and we experience them spatially. And until recently, the technology that we've had to work with is all pretty 2D, it's flat. And there are, we're now in the early days of tremendous advancement in 3D and spatial technology, everything from game development that's turned into virtual reality and augmented reality across multiple devices and platforms. You hear about this every day, there's a new innovation. We're probably looking at, at 3D and immersive technology is where the iPhone was 12 years ago in terms of the evolution of technology. So with these incredible tools that have been developed for gaming primarily, we now have the ability to create visual and spatial environments that we can use to organize our information in the same way when you go into your house and you've got stuff on a bookshelf or you know where things are across your desk or you go to a museum and you know where things are, even if you go to a public space. We, we connect with things in the space where we've seen them. So what we're doing is we're enabling people to tap into this visual and spatial memory by using what we would call kind of world building technologies, the kind of stuff that you might see in Minecraft or Second Life, and connecting it with a back end that's just basically a web application, and all the APIs that let us connect data into the front end of the 3D immersive environment. And nobody's really doing this. It's, it's you know, people are, are doing really cool games and entertainment, and there's a lot of marketing stuff that people are doing around augmented reality. But, but there aren't people that we've found, and there aren't many people that we see who are actually trying to build tools for consumers and for businesses that help us organize our knowledge. Um, 
So what we do, and we're going to just show you a brief sort of demo of a prototype. We've been prototyping this for the last nine months, and we're getting ready to release an alpha at the end of the summer. One of the things that we're going to need, and one of the reasons that I'm here is that I want to start to make you aware of it, because we're going to be looking for a couple hundred alpha users, hopefully local, who we can talk to in person. So that's one of my asks for today. But what, what I'm going to show you is a, a space that we call a Sagan. So it's a collection of knowledge. Um, that actually brings together real-time information from three different museums that all exists independently on the web, as well as additional information that somebody has collected in this space. And you could build this space, you could do this right now. We have an app that, with the tools that allow you to do it. And I think the, the, the thing that I want to kind of focus on for this today is not only does it allow you to assemble the knowledge in a way that's meaningful to you, but it, it brings together information that's typically siloed and often hidden. And hopefully by putting them into putting this information into a space that's visually powerful, that you actually can find new meaning and context by just connecting the, the data. So I'm gonna let so Ben Lampert is a, a new developer with Say and Works. He's actually also a hacker fellow and a recent graduate uh, from U of M. And I'm gonna let him jump in and yeah, give us a little demo. Cool. And I'll jump in where I need to. Time's up, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Just just go eat in the question time for the demo. Yeah. No worries. Sure. Thanks, Erica. So I'm gonna walk us through our park yeah. space. And in this space, you can see there's a bookshelf over there. And on that bookshelf, there are these books. And when you actually open these books up, there are live links to files or URLs. And it'll take you right to that knowledge. But let's go to that door right there. That looks interesting. So there's another space through here. And if you walk in, This space is dedicated to food-related art. Um, it's drawn from multiple different origins. Um, so we see here the Brooklyn Museum, Metropolitan, and the National Gallery, Gallery of Art. So these are all from open source databases which you can access today online. And we, we decided in order to narrow it down to use food as kind of a, a unifying theme in this context. So the actual visual media is displayed alongside these other 3D objects and these books. And with that, we're hoping to provide cues to users to let them remember the knowledge there. I think Erica could speak more to that. So I don't know if anybody is familiar with memory palaces um, and the notion of sort of space and visual objects as mnemonic devices. So the idea is that you can create things that help you remember. It could be that you put kind of an interesting object or a chair that, you know, with a zebra pattern or something alongside particular pieces of information and that will help sort of further connect you to it the next time you come back to it. And eventually you'll be able to share, I and mean, you actually can share this and also provide sort of visual interest points with other layers of context for people that might also want to browse through or collaborate with you in, in this space. And so this is, I know we don't have a lot of time, but you can kind of wander around. But again, this is three collections of paintings that are online, on the web, that you can find together. But we've brought them in in real time. You can click in the links that'll take you there. We actually have a browser that opens up within the space so you can actually do your browsing and drag a URL and put it on the bookshelf. You can pull a book off the shelf, open it up, and page through a PDF. I'm not gonna go too far into this, but that's essentially what we've got. Thank you, I'm gonna jump in the question. And bravo for doing the live demo. That doesn't happen often. It takes a certain <laughs> level of bravery to do so. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kyle, would you like to kick off a question? Yeah, sure. Um, who's your like initial target market? And like, are there is there a specific type of person you're thinking about? Is it? Yeah, initially, so we actually, we do have one corporate client, a software development company in town that we're actually doing some piloting with, and they're using it for knowledge management around some e-learning modules and creating an onboarding space so that when you're a new employee, you can actually walk through. Um, and then, but, but for our alpha, 
we're looking for what I would call a prosumer, which is probably a lot of you guys in this room. It's people who are constantly engaged with digital content and struggling to manage it. And also people who are maybe doing academic research and artists that are doing a lot online. And then later on, we're going to be looking at um, education and e-learning. I mean, we quite frankly, the more we show this to people, the more different use cases we come up with. And the, 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 cha the biggest challenge we have is like focusing on the right audience, the right market to begin with. Do you use Unity in your software development? Yes, we made a decision after, um, we, in our prototyping process, we explored a number of different platforms and we decided last year, we actually did the majority of the pro prototyping with like two developers over a period of six months, that Unity was ubiquitous, they're developing it, it works across platforms, and you can actually find more developers with Unity experience, even though it's still tough to find people with professional development experience with Unity. So. Well, time for one more question. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can phrase this succinctly. How do you manage the task of mapping objects to an appropriate Unity asset? Do you want to answer that? Uh, what was the question again? So how do you, this is meant to organize all our data, right? Yep. How much work do I have to put into it? Oh, okay. So for it to look at something and then pop an asset. So we have a variety of ways to actually import what we're calling knowledge into the app. So there are Chrome extensions, there's an iOS app, and we have a web app that the user can drag and drop their files into. And in the future, we're hoping to like integrate with uh, other apps like Dropbox, Google Drive, to pull your data that already exists into the app. Yeah, by by. by it represented, though? Sorry. So by the end, so here's so so there's a couple of things. One, actually, pull up the knowledge. So it says you can do a couple of things. You can there's a Chrome extension that works where you can save a URL and you can say I want it to go into this Sagan. So I want it to go to my food and art Sagan, and it will there'll be something reminding you that you put it there. Um, there's a broad palette where these are all documents that exist both in the web and can be updated in real time. And this is just a massive collection of knowledge and you can take that and drag that into things. You can open up a browser within a space and literally drag the URL and put it right where you want it. So it's really a mix and we're trying to, you know, one of the challenges is how can we make this fairly seamless and intuitive. Same thing where we will have a kind of a file manager, a finder that opens, and you can sync it with Evernote, Dropbox, and Google Drive to begin with. And you'll pull up an interface that looks like what you see on your computer, and you can drag a folder or a document straight into your space. And a lot of the pieces are there. We're just really working on some, some functional refinements. And we don't really have what I would call a UI. We're actually, this is what we have is what I would call a wireframe. And we're starting to move forward now with a more significant design. And actually, the biggest challenge I've had in hiring is a user experience visual designer that can bring together app design with 3D and spatial design. It's like a pretty difficult challenge. Well, thank you so much okay. for the presentation. All right, I'm going to shift gears from VR to uh, health tech. Um, so I'm pleased to welcome Lauren Hamel um, from Disco App. Uh, Disco App is a patient app to prompt cancer treatment cost discussions. Um, this is a tool to increase the patient physician interaction about direct and indirect cancer treatment costs. Um, was anyone at the uh, fast forward medical innovation uh, one we did? So. Um, Lauren was one of the folks that we were trying to get in that, but that filled up, and um, so I now think, I'm yeah, pleased I, to have I heard that bad cold that was going around, so I had to graciously excuse myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks everyone for uh, having me here tonight. Um, as Brian said, my name is Lauren Hamill. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Medicine at Wayne State, and I'm also a part of the Carmanos Cancer Institute. So, I'm disclosing that up front to let you all know that I am an academic by training, and that's where I spend most of my time. So, I really and pulled up in my office writing grants and papers, but occasionally I do get let out, and then I get to do things like this, although it is after hours, so nobody noticed I left. Um, but what I'm gonna share with you today is a project I've been working on, and Brian asked me to send a fun fact about my, my project, and it took me a while to like think about like, what I would consider fun about it, because it's about <laughs> cancer, but really, is I did not start out 
thinking of this as a product. Like I started out thinking about a behavioral intervention that I wanted to implement in our clinics to improve communication and care for patients. But as I spent more time in the tech space, I, I have been encouraged to think about it more as a product. So this is why I'm doing things like these, because really I'm looking for advice and guidance from people in this world that I really know nothing about, other than I'm totally caught up on Silicon Valley. That's it, that's all I've got. That's so, good start. <laughs> yeah, I'm entertaining. Um, so my research is focused in the world of cancer, and I'm sure that that's something that everyone in this room has brushed up against in one way or another, right? So um, one thing I'm focused on is the increased economic burden that cancer patients are facing. So cancer patients are living longer due to advances in treatment, and many of those treatments are very expensive. And many of those costs are being shifted to the patient. So we're calling this increased economic burden financial toxicity. And what we're learning is that patients who experience this kind of financial toxicity are increasingly likely to go into debt, to file for bankruptcy, to have their treatment interrupted, and then it may also hasten mortality, it may actually lead to, um, to death. Um, in the US, the cost of cancer uh, treatment is expected to get up to about 160 billion by 2020. So it's likely that this problem is only gonna get worse. Now, many cancer um, professionals, uh, including professional organizations, um, colleges, social workers, and other providers, have, have advocated that physicians should be talking about these costs with patients earlier on in the treatment as a way to start alleviating financial toxicity. So if we start bringing it up earlier, patients and providers can do things to make sure that um, a patient's proactive with the, with the costs that they're likely to incur. Seems like a simple thing to do, um, but it sort of sounded like it, what they weren't really happening. Self-report data were saying that these kinds of discussions aren't happening. So to find out if this was indeed the case, I led an investigation of 103 video recorded interactions between patients and physicians to find out if these discussions occurred. Briefly, what we found is that less than half talked about costs in any sort of meaningful way, and they weren't very in-depth conversations. So, okay, again, approaching this as an academic, what do you do? So one tool that my colleagues and I have had a lot of success with in terms of improving communication and care for patients are called question prompt lists, or QPLs. Very simple lists of questions that patients can ask their providers. We've had a lot of success in terms of outcomes. But the problem is, is they're static, so you can't tailor it to an individual, and they're also um, not focused on cost. Very um, limited questions about that. So I thought perhaps we could build an app. So as I mentioned, I've been working with various people um, between our two universities and also professional software developers, and I built um, the discussion of cost app, or the DISCO app. So this is what patients will get. So I have a working app now. Um, they'll get it before they see their, their oncologist, and it'll take them through a brief demographic survey where they enter in really simple things like what kind of cancer they have, what kind of treatment um, they are, um, have been uh, recommended if they know it, um, things about their health insurance if they know it, um, their employment status, what their annual household income is, and then general kind of financial questions. And then it'll populate a tailored list of questions that they can decide whether or not they want to ask their physician. So patients can go through each section of questions, select which ones they want, and then print it out separately so they can take it into their um, meeting with their oncologist. So kind of moving my science forward, I did some initial acceptability testing with survivors, oncologists, and social workers, took them through the app, asked them their feedback on everything, and generally what I found was the survivors really liked it. They said they wish they had had something when they were sick. The social workers loved it because it was bringing it up earlier. The oncologists were far less impressed. They were very concerned that it would disrupt their conversations they were having. I don't know if any of you have worked with physicians. They're very difficult to change. And you have to be very you know, uh, persuasive and charming when you need them to do something. So I have revised the app based on this feedback. I've revised my protocol as I'm preparing to pilot test it in the clinic. So I have a few oncologists who are willing to um, try it out, and they've agreed to have their uh, interactions video recorded with their patients. So I'll be able to test this um, within the next month, very likely, to see how patients use it, if it influences their discussions, and if it influences the outcomes that we think that they will. So really, as I mentioned, I'm here today. I, I'm in a position as a scientific member of the Cancer Institute where I can test this potentially across the state. I'll be able to get some solid data on the effectiveness of it, but sort of, you know, 
a very wise woman told me, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm looking for advice and guidance on sort of where to go next. I've, I've been encouraged by our tech people at Wayne and also the U of M to start looking in the, in the startup space. But again, I'm here as a nerdy academic, so I don't really know. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, and thanks again. We're glad you're here. This is a, a terrific presentation of the problem you identified. Uh, I'll start with Erica. Do you have any um, IP issues? Do you own the app, or is it owned? Okay. It's a partnership between me and the university. Okay. Yeah, so good question. In fact, I jotted down the notes about the, the law. Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, entrepreneurship clinic. Yeah, 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 yeah but I well. might be uh, um, seeking some more advice on that. And they might have a tech transfer, they have tech transfer programs, they have programs yes. that are good. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, who would the customer be like? In other words, who might pay for this? And in our hospitals incentivize to get their patients to ask these questions. Right. So I think um, in, in I think selling it to the cancer centers makes the most sense. I don't think going to the individual patient would be wise. And I think it depends on what kind of outcomes I can show. So if we can show that patients adhere better, if we can show that they're able to, you know go through treatment without being interrupted, and if I can save the cancer center money in that, I mean, that's kind of a long shot. Like, if you think of like the downstream effects, like, if I'm saying a conversation here, it's gonna affect all these things down here. Like, I'm gonna have to, um, you know, have a, you know, a, lot of, a lot of statistical power to do that. Um, so I think it's kind of making that case to them, is what can we do to make their clinic more efficient? So is this <coughs> web-based? Because I would think that having it web-based would allow you to basically make it available on any computer. The, the patient can fill it out at home. Mm -hmm. uh, I think eventually that's what I'd like to do. Because I'm testing it the way I am, I want to have control of it for now. So I have it um, as an app on like a tablet that I would give to the patient before they would meet. But I think once I'm able to test it and show more, I would like it. And what kind of tablets are you putting it on? iPads. iPad. Mm -hmm. Question up in the back. So it looked at, like on your slides when they, and, you know, when they fill out the survey to figure out what their customer's questions would be, they're printing them out and then bringing those in. Um, since you're already on a mobile app, why don't you have it as like in the questions on the app too, so that they can record their answers that way? Um, that we that's a good question and something that we considered before. Um, a lot of our survivors advised having actually something to write on. Um, the average age of our cancer patients is over 60. Um, so I think there was a concern that the having the app for that part of it might not be very user friendly, especially when they're in kind of a time crunched meeting. So having something paper based to take notes on um, was better for the first kind of pilot. There's a second question in the back. You said that the, uh, the untailored QPLs had a, had a lot of success. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So we've seen that they are um, very successful in terms of getting patients to be more active in the interaction. They ask more questions just in general, but we can also get them to ask things more, like more specific questions. And we've also found that it's led to improvements kind of on the other end of the interaction. So patients' role in the decision making, patients' um, satisfaction and trust with their physician. Um, I'm trying to think of something more, more specific um, related to like actual like treatment outcomes. So there's, again, the downstream effects are harder to track, but with what I'm proposing for like the big project is I would track patients for about 10 months after the interaction, so I'd be able to kind of extend that understanding as well. So what happens with that relationship um, kind of on the other side? Yep. You mentioned that the oncologists were the ones that were hesitant. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So there are two big things. One was time, because they're already in a very short exam room setting, or um, uh, examination setting, and also uh, a lot of them feared that they wouldn't have the answers. So in response to that, what we did was develop a very short kind of oncologist tip sheet that kind of gave them some scripts they could follow and ideas to think about. Really what I would like to do is turn this into a much more comprehensive intervention. So there would be like a learning module for oncologists to go through, but until I can get more money to do that, kind of doing a sort of piecemeal. Um, yeah, but the big thing they were worried about was just like, I have no idea what their co-pays are. I don't know what, um, um, you know, uh, you know, how much they're, they're, it's like, it's like science or medicine is like the only thing that we have that doesn't have a menu. And oncologists, you know, are frustrated. I mean, understandably so, they are. And so we've also really emphasized that 
that discussion needs to happen with the primary um, oncologist, but that there are people on the other side to help. So it's not the oncologist's job to necessarily take the patient through this, but there are financial navigators, there's social workers, and that these discussions can help identify them earlier. But I think that you, your core customer, though, the oncologist. Sorry? I think your core customer, essentially. It would be, the, the, I think, the cancer center. That's all the time we have for questions. Thank you. All right, now we're going to get to uh, advice of another sort. Uh, Jessica Willis, pleased to welcome you up here. Jessica has a company called Pocket Nest. Pocket Nest provides financial planning to Gen X and Millennials in a digital format. Um, fun fact about Pocket Nest: uh, Jessica has a has a young uh, child, an eight-year-old daughter. Um, and I could relate to this because I have a six-year-old son who likes me to draw comics with him. But she's been trying to uh, uh, improve your logo, and we might get a little peek of that. Uh, so, yeah, take it away, Jessica. Well, I will as soon as. Oh, is it like split screening? It's split screening. Yeah. Okay. I would love you to do that. Great, thank you. <laughs> Jessica Willis, founder and CEO of Pocket Nest. Pocket Nest provides do-it-yourself financial planning for Gen X and Millennials in a digital format. Um, let's see if this works. So these are three <laughs> recent drawings for my eight-year-old, and she's a really high achiever, and I don't have the heart to tell her that she keeps missing the K. <laughs> <laughs> so at home we go by Pocket Nest. <laughs> All right, um, so I like to start my pitch with a story of my friend Julie. Julie found herself unexpectedly widowed a year and a half ago. And because I'm in the industry, she asked me to go with her to a meeting with the CPA and the estate attorney, and of course I was happy to do that. And on the way to the meeting, she said, you know, my only saving grace is knowing that Mark's love of the markets and of investments, everything is probably fine from a financial standpoint. And as we went to the meeting, what we found was that that wasn't the case. Um, she didn't have, he didn't have the life insurance that she thought was there, and it wasn't enough to cover things for her and her 12-year-old son. Uh, Mark held assets inside of an IRA that the IRS does not allow you to hold inside of an IRA. There was a lot more debt, and the estate documents were not finalized. So the short of it is, everything was a mess. And if Julie and Mark had had the chance to go step by step through everything in their financial plan, she wouldn't have been in the situation that she was in. So the problem is that financial plans are incomplete. 90% of you and the rest of the world um, are missing at least one critical element to a complete financial plan. And for those of you who think you're on the 10% that you know have everything done, I have news for you. 50% of people who think they have everything done are actually missing something really, really important. And the question is, why aren't our finances complete? Why aren't we getting things in order? And it's because um, a lot of people think finances are not fun. I totally disagree with you. Um, we feel overwhelmed and we feel like we should know more than we do when we try to address our finances with professionals. And there's a lot of mistrust in our industry um, towards financial professionals. And so the solution is Pocket Nest. This is where we come in. So Pocket Nest provides do-it-yourself financial planning. We walk users through all 10 themes of financial planning. 
So we address everything from um, investments to building a budget, building your net worth statement, 529 college savings plan, insurance, uh, estate planning, income tax planning, and a very important annual review. Don't count because I think I missed one in there. Um, and, and one of the things that we uh, are compare ourselves to frequently is the robo-advisors. They've brilliantly figured out the investment piece of putting your finances in order, but they're not proactive in addressing everything else in, uh, in comprehensive finances. So here's how we do it. We ask our users really simple, easy questions. Based on how they answer those questions, our users get uh, recommendations and to-dos. Those to-dos flow into the pocket nest to-do list. Um, and users can access these to-dos as they have time. At any given moment, a user knows how far along in their financial plan they are and which of the themes are complete and which aren't. And users receive digital badges as they go uh, as achievements. Um, users can navigate through the app through our, plat our, um, our dashboard there. So PocketNest is always free to user. Uh, our revenue model is a two-tiered approach. Tier one is a lead gen model. When we connect our users with um, third parties that we've done really high due diligence on and we trust and we communicate that to our users, we get revenue that way. And then we also have a white label uh, approach with institutions, both financial and non-financial institutions. We have nearly 380 pre-launch subscribers. Um, my timer's running out, so I'm gonna go a little bit quicker. We came in second place in the Detroit FinTech Challenge. Uh, we're involved in Inform's Masterclass in Ann Arbor, um, Ann Arbor Sparks Boot Camp. Um, we've gotten 16 grand in uh, grants and awards. Um, our target market is the, the initial market is the 24 million Gen X and Millennials that uh, are married and have college degrees because that demographic is eagerly, eagerly looking to get everything in order. Um, and, and parents, sorry, I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, so young parents, college degrees, Gen X and Millennials. At the same time, we'll be pursuing the 50,000 uh, SEC registered investment advisors and global banks for a total addressable market of 3.6 billion. Um, the team is in process. Um, so I have 18 years experience in wealth management, my MBA from Quinlan uh, School of Business um, Loyola. I'm a CFP and CPWA um, undergrad degree from Michigan. Ashley Craven is our marketing officer. She's a grad degree from Wake Forest undergrad from Michigan. We have some great contract help and we're in the process of really finalizing our technical team. Um, so there's no, I'm not raising capital right now. Uh, I've bootstrapped everything so far. Um, since we have a workable prototype um, and we're in the process of building an MVP. Um, I'm trying to get that as far as I can on my own without before raising capital. But the ask is if um, we're looking for institutional partners. So if you know anybody or if you're involved with banks or investment firms um, or any other companies, institutions that you think your end users could benefit from this, we'd love to talk to you, um, mostly for customer discovery. We're always looking for mentors and talent and I'm asking all of you to subscribe um, on our website, that would be really helpful too. It's just a monthly newsletter. So this round of yeah, that, that was terrific. Uh, questions? I'm sure we got some here. Start down here. Have you considered selling this direct to consumers in a way it wouldn't trigger a call from a financial advisor? Oh yeah. Yeah, so um, it's really, as I said, the, I, I ran out of time, so I didn't get to kind of dive into that, but the two-tiered approach, um, so the plan is to go direct to user from zero to a thousand users to test it out, find out that we don't know what we don't know, and, and see what really works with our users. At the same time, slowly talking to these institutional institutions to see how to white label or license with them. Um, but there, there's certainly this this unserved market of individuals with that have between zero and a million dollars that need financial planning. Um, and so we're hoping to kind of address that that need and see where it takes us with that initial pitch. Does that answer your, mm -hmm. your question? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> are you doing any kind of marketing to banks or uh, uh, credit uh, unions to uh, say, here's a program that will help you plan your spending and everything? Um, for their end users? Yes. Yes, exactly. So um, we've talked to, um, through Ann Arbor Sparks Boot Camp, I've gone through a lot of customer discovery and I've talked to some huge banks and I've talked to um, regional banks, community banks, local banks, and same thing on the uh, investment space, the really large firms down to the small firms. And what we're finding is that the niche is probably in the smaller size, so the community banks, it's exactly So, so a credit union would be 
the credit unions, the community banks, they, and, and the regional banks, they're really trying to, um, to do two things. One, address the Gen X and millennial question, um, address a digital, how to have a digital ready, you know, customer facing platform, um, and also how to gather data on their users really efficiently because people don't want to come into the banks anymore. And so the idea is if, our, if these individuals open bank accounts, um, and then it follows up with an email of, look, we can help you get your finances in order, fill this out as you have time, and that communicates back to the bank. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I'm a measure friend here. Um, so th th I think this space is really interesting. Like, uh, you need a budget. Anyone use that YNAB? It's like a great tool for learning budgeting. Um, I've also heard of startups around um, the, uh, uh, like getting a will or like your you know, information together. What's the, you described a really great pain at the beginning that your friend had. What, um, what are the other pains that people are getting? Because right? it's like they have to feel something to yeah. say like if they want to do this. I'm curious how, if that is a big part of what you're trying to address. It is. Something I'm trying to figure out is the cell um, aspirin, not vitamins, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. it's like going to the dentist and trying to eat well and exercise, which yep. means need to be doing more of, we all do, right? Yeah. Um, so that, that's like the million dollar question and uh -huh. how do I get in front of users? What The reason I'm initially targeting those Gen X and Millennials that have kids is because over my career, um, I'm, I'm 39, I have three kids, and, and over the last 10, 15 years as my friends had kids, they'd call me and say, hey, can we go out to lunch? We want to talk through everything. And within an hour, I could sort of give them this to-do list of all these things that need to be, be done mm -hmm. um, so that they sleep at night. So the pain point, the action item that's making people move is really having kids. And you have young kids, so mm -hmm. you might be able to speak to that. But um, I am looking for that, you know, more of that aspirin. I, I, yeah. Besides when it's too late, like for my friend Julie, you know, she certainly could get everything on her order. Um, and so we're thinking about maybe even marketing that way, kind of the, do you have a Beaumont doctor? Remember that campaign that caused a little bit of fear that, um, you know, how to, how to tell people you need to get things in order before it's too late. That's, that's a great answer. You're definitely thinking about no, it. No, thank you, uh, Yes. So I guess uh, at the moment, Dropbox this app is free to download and use at Apple Store and iOS. It's not built yet. Oh, it's not built No, yet. I'm sorry, oh, okay. I didn't get that quite out. Um, so we have a working prototype that has half of the content working. Um, but we haven't started building the back end yet. And so the hope is to start that in the next couple weeks and then it'll be about three or four months from there when it'll be up and running. Okay. Actually, my question was, uh, what are the plans to later on in the future, how to monetize it? Yeah, so the um, to monetize it is um, each time we, so free to user, but each time we connect our users with a partner, like um, if they need if they need life insurance, we connect them to Policy Genius. Um, if they need an estate plan, as Brian mentioned, there's some really great online tools, so willing.com. If they need insurance, we can connect, or investments, we can connect them to personal capital. Each of those third parties, which I know I've done due diligence on, you know, we want to be really transparent with our users, um, but they provide revenue back to us. So that's the, the first revenue model, but the greater vision is to white label with the banks and the um, institutions. And it, the most interesting thing is I've talked to three nonprofits that serve low-income housing families, and they're looking for a tool to um, provide finance, financial planning to their users too. That's all the time we have for right now. Uh, thank you so much. Let's go. Did you arrive? Nicholas was the fifth presenter. I have not met him. Uh, I'm guessing by the fact that he's not raising his hand that he's not here. Uh, so that's going to wrap up our pitches for this evening. Um, now we're on to community announcements. So uh, if you would, anyone who has an announcement to make, you have a meetup, you have a company you're hiring for, you have an idea you want some specific feedback for, um, please come on down here and uh, make, your, make your pitch to this group. Don't be shy. Hello everyone, my name is Austin Yarger. I am a game development lecturer at the University of Michigan uh, and the founder of IGDA, oh, I'm not my camera. The founder of the International Game Developers Association, uh, Ann Arbor chapter in Ypsilanti. It's a meetup that is taking place in two days on Thursday. Uh, and uh, every single month we have it, we get some really awesome developers coming, a lot of artists, uh, a lot of technical engineers, a lot of Unity devs. Um, Erica was there not too long ago. Um, 
And so if you're really interested in seeing uh, teams making games, uh, making interactive technology products, uh, we'll see you Thursday. If you want more information, igda2.org. igda2.org. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I didn't even do anything, so. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Scott Gosey, and I have a couple meetups that I organize and a couple events that I want to say, so I'm gonna go fast. Uh, one of them is, if you want to learn how to code, if you saw some of these startups today and you're, you're really gunning to try to build your own startup, uh, I run a group called Ann Arbor Coffeehouse Coders. We meet every other Wednesday, this is the other. So next Wednesday, we will have a meetup event. It's on meetup.com, check us out there. If you're a startup and you need some co-working place, the Tech Brewery is the place for you. I co-organize the Tech Brewery up on Jones Drive. We have parking, we have space, we have desks. We just need startups, so come join us there. And then, of course, if you need a job, uh, Ann Arbor Spark is a great job board powered by a great job board company, TrueJob, which is the company that I co-founded. So please use it to find jobs, tech jobs, here in Ann Arbor. That's it. Thank you. My name is Russell Schindler and I run a meetup up at Traverse City and on our meetup we actually have a job board and it's run by True Job as well. Thank you. And uh, uh, we do, uh, so I'm inviting everybody that presented today to come on up to Traverse City. We actually give away $500 every month, so as voted on by the audience. So uh, in this month... Not to everybody, but just like... No, we just have just one winner. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, in June, twice a year, we do what's, what we call a bar napkin pitch night. So it's just, you don't have to have a product, you, don't, you just gotta have an idea. You can even literally put it on a bar napkin, you get one minute, one slide, get up there, pitch your wild idea. Uh, we've done it now, this will be our fourth time. We do it twice a year, and uh, some of these have actually turned into businesses and gotten funded, so it's a lot of fun. Love it. So I'm Ben Meza Wilson. Um, I'm just uh, wrapping up my graduate studies um, in transportation plan planning here, and um, I have an idea for uh, a last mile, um, fully automated vehicle, um, and I'm looking for partners that want to do a pilot project in that. And actually, the the self-driving vehicle starts out as a vehicle that is not self-driven, that's driven by a human being, and the process gradually, the vehicle will graduate as it logs miles to be a self, fully self-driving solution. And um, so I'm looking for mentors and um, funding for the vehicle itself, and maybe for like a charging station, some operating funds. I'm here um, supporting Ann Arbor Health Hacks. Um, our annual hackathon is coming up uh, next month. So our big medical hackathon is the weekend of June 22nd to the 24th. Uh, we also have a meetup uh, next Tuesday. Um, you can get more information at a2healthhacks.org or you can come talk to me after. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. I'm Rob Schwalm. I'm new to meetup. This is actually my first meetup meeting that I've attended. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I, uh, I represent a company and an entity that is very unique. Um, it is called America's Real Deal. We are the first interactive TV reality show that will be launched this fall, very similar to Shark Tank. And I'm sure everybody here knows about Shark Tank, right? Sure. Yeah. And everybody here has watched American Idol, right? Nobody has done the, any. Has you, nobody watched those two. Okay. All right. I just needed some response. So, <clears throat> unlike Shark Tank, um, we are allowing America to become the sharks. So, when the companies come and pitch, they will sit before Kevin Harrington, if you've known him, one of the original sharks in Shark Tank, father of the infomercial, uh, brought a number of TV reality shows to television, and to Forbes Riley, who is the queen of Home Shopping Network. They will pitch. They will, uh, Kevin Harrington and Forbes will discuss how they can better market their business. And then America will have the opportunity to use an app created by the TV show, which is to do three things. One is to, to on the spot invest through a crowdfunding portal. Two is to buy the product. 
and three for the entertainment value will be to vote. So there will be an entrepreneur at the end of the year, which will be awarded, um, but it'll be very interactive. We're going to bring investment, investing to the lazy boy, to the, uh, the couch of, the, of every American that is 18 years or older, with the ability to invest in brand new companies, with brand new concepts, brand new products. It'll be totally interactive, and it'll be funded through the, a brand new stock exchange called the Independent Stock Market, which we're birthing um, small and medium-sized businesses on a global basis. So we're brand new. I'm a TV talent scout for them. This is absolutely ripe territory for that. You know, to look to talk with companies and people who want to get debt-free funding and move along the channel and possibly a spot on the show. So, so you're looking for people to participate in this? I am looking for, for inventors, entrepreneurs, franchise expansionists, business expansion, people who are looking for financing, um, depending on what level of business that they're operating in. Um, they can get up to $50 million debt-free. It just depends on where they're at in their process. Um, you know, for example, your product, very enticing um, from a consumer perspective, something that would showcase extremely well. I see a different application for it, but you know, it's something, somebody who has something that they can market to consumers, right? Something that is very appealing, user-friendly, lifestyle changing, um, industry disruptive, all of that. We're gonna disrupt the industry with investing. We're gonna disrupt the industry in TV because we're the first interactive TV show. Never been done before, and uh, we, we're launching a brand new stock market that's been seven years in the making. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, we'll be back here next month, uh, June 19th. Uh, we have Sellin Innovations. Um, sorry they couldn't make it tonight, they had to reschedule. Uh, they will be there, but I have four open slots. So if you would like to pitch in uh, June, email organizers at a2newtech.org. Uh, June or July. Uh, we'll be here June 19th and July 17th. Um, oh, I forgot to plug this. Uh, we have a Slack, a uh, community Slack group for uh, a group called Made in A2. Made in Ann Arbor, Made in A2.com. If you go to Made in A2.com slash Slack, you can chat with people that have uh, attended tonight or a couple other hundred uh, folks in the Ann Arbor area. Uh, and uh, we're going to head over to Dominic's after this, which is literally just down the street. Uh, and uh, have some appetizers courtesy of Ann Arbor Spark. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs>